this month. A new record and a shake-up in the Volvo. The high-tech TPs kick off in Croatia. Plus, the world's biggest worlds get closer. But first, three remaining legs, three boats in contention, three points between them, and just one prestigious trophy at stake. The race across the Atlantic was fast, record-breaking fast, but the ride had come at a price. Broken gear, damaged pride, stress, flat calms, and yet another shake-up on the leaderboard. Leg nine of the Volvo Ocean Race had it all. As the fleet set out from Newport, Rhode Island for the 3,300 mile transatlantic leg to Cardiff, the end of the race was sliding into view. From Cardiff, two short legs remained before the winner could be crowned. Yet the points gap was closing. Time was running out. At the Newport start, the battle between Dong Fong and Mapfrey was still raging. But Bao Becking's Brunel was now putting serious pressure on the favorites. One day into the leg, the weather forecast looked set to split the fleet. Teams had to decide on their route. There's two options. Either you take a southerly route towards the Gulf Stream or you take the shortcut going up north direction Nova Scotia. And, uh, and I think that was the, the, the decider probably already of the leg. We were leading the race when we decided to go north. We thought everybody was going north. It was a mistake. And uh, we have not really no wind in the north and the other one we are going full speed. We were lucky that the split was there, that the two boats who were ahead of us took the wrong route and we took the right route. You can't afford to make you know, tactical mistakes and we have had a couple of moments where we've just gone the wrong way, just got the wrong side of something and suddenly you're uh, 10 or 20 behind and then that's it, there's no way back. And then another surprise as conditions lined up for a record-breaking run. Brunel were the first to set a new 24-hour distance record, twice. But Axo Noble were going even quicker. We knocked out a 602 nautical miles in 24 hours, which to me was um, unachievable. I remember when the guy said from down below, yeah, we broke 600, I kind of called, no, nah, not true. You know, you need to go back down and double check, triple check. He's got a 24-hour record. That was pretty special. Everything lined up just perfectly. Boat, crew, weather, waves, current, wind, you name it, it was all there in place. After riding a punchy weather front for six days, the wind shut down on the fleet. Two days later, the breeze switched off once again, this time within striking distance of the finish. Cordrelier's Dongfang were among those that had parked up. Ali, come on, we need some wind. And the tension was starting to show. I lost two Figaro in this kind of bay. Yeah. Uh, arriving a lead leader and finishing 25, uh, lost three hours. While the pressure from behind was intense, there was relief ahead for Brunel as they took the leg win. We're tremendously happy, but I think most important is that we, we sailed again a very good leg. We're here for racing, we want to win this race, and uh, it's going the, the right way uh, how we like to see it. Behind them, Axo Noble finished second, with Dongfang finishing third. Quadrelier's team were now back in the overall lead. The relief was clear to see. Uh, it's not too bad, it's a very short lead, and uh, it's it's far from finished, but... Meanwhile, stress aboard Mapfre, who crossed the line in fifth. It's been not an easy leg for us. It's been painful from day one, basically, and we never could catch up. But, you know, it's uh, not much more we could do, and of course we'll fight it all the way to the end. The overall scores had been shuffled once again. Three teams separated by three points. With just two legs left to run, the pressure was back on. 
The next leg from Cardiff to Gothenburg would be a sprint, 1,300 miles around the top of the UK. So what was the plan? There's not a red boat, there is not a yellow boat, there is just opponents. So the boats are grey and we have to, to sail against everybody and uh, be ahead of everybody. And I prefer this situation than when you think too much about one boat. It's not usually when you do big mistakes. It's a different leg though, it's a, it is a five days leg, but it's a, almost a coastal leg where you know, we have a lot of turning points, a lot of uh, you know, strict headings to, to stick to, and, and hopefully it's, uh, I wouldn't say easier or simpler, but you know, maybe a little bit more straightforward. I think uh, we just take it on the horns and, uh, and just sell whatever we think in the beginning part, what is the best. Just sell the boat at, uh, at a maximum speed and, and believe the direction where you're going. While the skippers were playing it cool, every team knew that the line between success and defeat was finer than ever. Join us in part two to find out what happened in leg 10. It was the first ever GC32 World Championships and the first time that the fleets of the GC32 Racing Tour and the Extreme Sailing Series had competed at the same venue. After 16 races and tricky conditions on Lake Garda, Team Tilt were crowned world champions. Yeah, it's a really special feeling, especially it's uh, our first uh, world champion title for the whole team. Really cool to share it all, with all my mates and yeah, really special moment. Behind them, SAP Extreme Sailing Team took second with Oman Air in third. Two weeks later, the Extreme Sailing Series headed to Barcelona, where Alinghi took their second win of the 2018 season. We ended up the night nicely because uh, we won before the last race, so we, uh, we could uh, play a little game on SAP, so they, they moved back to third, so it's really good for us and uh, the overall season leaderboard. The Swiss have been locked in a struggle for the top spot with SAP since Act 1 in Muscat, Oman. Alinghi's latest victory now leaves them tied on points on the overall series leaderboard. But the event hadn't been without drama. Following a collision with Red Bull sailing team, Oman Air was forced to sit out the remaining races on day three. But when they returned to the race course, Phil Robertson's team climbed the ranks to finish Act 3 in second place, leaving them third in the overall series. We had to scramble pretty hard to get ready and get out on the water racing again, so yeah, it was pretty nice to be able to finish the regatta off on a high note. Next stop is Cascais, Portugal, for Act 4. That's a wrap for the Extreme Sailing Series. The goal is simple, yet the task is still one of the greatest challenges, sailing single-handed, non-stop around the world. When they set out on the Golden Globe on the 1st of July, crews will be recreating the pioneering race of 50 years ago that was won by Sir Robin Knox Johnston. Each will be competing alone, sailing similar sized yachts and using similar equipment to Sir Robin in the original race in 1968. The boat itself is, is a very ordinary type boat, you know, this is the sort of boat that if you were in England you could you know, just sail it anywhere up to Scotland, whatever you like. Um, it, it's a normal everyday type boat. And they were designed and before 1988 and so everything about that era prior to 1988, the, the hull structure was really strong as well. And they've got a, a strong reputation already, they're, they're, they're noted for being good ocean going boats, they're not flimsy at all. There's a lot of sailors around the world that, that can relate because we're sailing very similar to boats to what they've actually got. And they could imagine themselves in something like this if they really wanted to do it. This is something a chap with a very small budget and a pretty average little cruising boat can go and do. But how will this generation of skippers approach the challenge? I think if they can get through the first month, I think life out there, simple life, it's like in the mountains, it's just simple life, it's about you know, surviving, all, all the everyday hassles are gone and it's, it's just about you and, and you, know, you won't get much closer to, to nature than being, you know, in the middle of the Southern Ocean when you've got no control over anything that it does. If you're not scared, why well, something is wrong. You know, you have to be, you have to be scared, it's, it's good. And sure, there'll be a winner and, and uh, uh, there'll be those that can sail better than others, but everyone that gets to the finish and achieves that goal of, of recreating Robin's journey, you know, all the way around the world with basic technology, they're the ones that are the winners and they're the ones that will be satisfied.
Coming up next, the most advanced racing monohulls in the world. Welcome back. Still to come, how crews are shaping up for the world's biggest worlds, and how the penultimate leg of the Volvo put everything at stake. But first, the opening event of the 2018 52 Super Series in Croatia. Taking bets on the 52 Super Series is risky. Last year's racing went down to the wire, and this year the picture is no clearer. Five regattas at five key locations in a fleet of the world's most advanced monohulls, sailed by the world's top crews. There's little to separate them on paper. The racing is incredibly close. One mistake and you're right out the back. It's really easy for the last year's winner to be last place in a race and it's uh, uh, everybody's got a chance. This will be the toughest circuit I think I, that I've been involved with and you know I'm embarrassed to admit that I've been at every single 52 event ever held and when you look at the talent from top to bottom here you know it's uh, it's pretty daunting. Nine of the 12 strong fleet are brand new, multi-million dollar machines, technically advanced and highly refined. Yet performance indicators are scarce and the teams provide few clues, despite the number of world championship titles, Olympic medals and the America's Cup victories among the fleet, it's still hard to pick a winner. Any one of I reckon eight teams could win this year, it's really seriously that close. In the past there's probably only ever three teams. One clue is to look at the teams with new boats. Among them, Azura won last year's series for the third time and have Olympic gold medalist Santiago Langer as tactician. You need to keep improving. You know, if, if we don't improve every day on our speeds, for sure some other teams will do and then at the end of the season we will have a problem. Quantum are also serial winners taking the title three times. They have an America's Cup program running alongside, headed by Terry Hutchinson and have cup skipper Dean Barker taking the helm. You know, I feel that we complement each other well on the boat and uh, you know, I think he, he brings a you know, very high level intensity and you know, I guess you know, I try to balance that out a little bit at times. America's Cup challenger of record, Luna Rossa, enters the 52 Super Series for the first time. They have a star-studded cast, including Oracle Racing's cup winning skipper, Jimmy Spithill. It's a different discipline. It can be just as challenging, for sure but it's taking me a little while to get my head around it, you know, just, just in terms of where you're looking for the puffs and, and how long it takes for something to arrive, how long it takes to get somewhere. But certainly you have a lot of time to talk about stuff, that's for sure. After a long and busy winter of building, this was the first time that the 2018 fleet had been assembled and there was plenty to look at. We spent probably 25,000 man hours uh, in the shed uh, to get the boat complete and then uh, probably that again uh, to make the boat sailable with all the systems and uh, bits and pieces that go into them. Everybody has individually come up with their own solutions to the way they like to sail their boats. I think you have a look around at the deck layouts and everyone's unique, they've got their little bits and pieces but for sure hull volume's changed a little bit, balance of the boats has changed a little bit and uh, the designers think that they have a faster boat than they did last year. But there'd been one area of focus for all the teams. The emphasis on, on let's say, the first upwind legs and, and the marks have been so tense now that they just have to, let's say, concentrate on that part. The biggest gains that the class has made is on, on the way the balances works on, on these kind of boats. So they really now are, let's say, set up. They just want to go upwind. They don't want to go anywhere else. Forty percent of our training time has been focusing on our starts and out of the start, making sure that we get the boat in the right gear to, uh, to hold lines with the other boats, because that's the key. If you can get your nose out of the rest of the pack after two minutes of the start, you're going to be looking very good. You're going to be top five in the mark. But if you get a little bit of slip in the pre-start, these nice friends will not be waiting for you. When the talking stopped and the racing began, it was clear that no one could take anything for granted. 
As if setting the scene for the rest of the week, the first day's racing saw two teams share the top spot as Platoon and Quantum each scored a first and a fourth. Day two saw another team muscle onto the podium as Sled took a comfortable win in the coastal race. Day three saw Quantum Racing fight their way back to the front of the pack, winning the first of two races. But it was Paprik's solid win in the second race of the day that proved how a largely amateur crew could still beat the big guns. Day four saw Quantum take the first win. Provesa took the second. The final day's racing proved how tough it was to maintain a winning streak. Here, Quantum finished seventh, enough to take the overall win, but their path to victory had not been easy. Losing sucks. I just didn't back myself, and that's disappointing because I've got to say it with confidence. You know, the guys did such great work all week long, really, with the boat that, um, yeah, I mean, being critical, but it's good to win. <laughs> Five teams had taken wins in the eight races. Writing the form guide for 2018 is going to be harder than ever. Leg 10 from Cardiff to Gothenburg didn't need any pre-start hype. Just three points separated the top three boats. Just 1,300 miles lay ahead, a coastal sprint in Volvo terms. The start would be critical. Gaining a jump on the fleet would deliver an enviable advantage, and all the teams knew it. Beat the two red boats, and, uh, and then we're getting closer. For maybe we play a bit too much mattressing with Mapre. You no, know, we try to start strong and keep the, the whole leg pushing the whole way. I've been running around all Cardiff trying to work out how I get 10,000 quid on Bowie to win the race. No one wants to take the bet. <laughs> Come the start, the weather threw in a curveball and did nothing to calm nerves. 24 hours later, Dong Fong had taken the lead as the fleet tiptoed past the Fastnet Rock off Ireland's southern coast. The next stage to Scotland was bittersweet. The breeze was in, the boat speeds up, but the options to overtake had reduced. Dong Fung had pulled back to second. With Matfrey still leading, the pair looked set to arrive in Gothenburg as joint leaders overall. And if they did, ultimate victory in the 45,000-mile Volvo Ocean Race could come down to the final 700-mile leg. But then the tables turned. On the drag race to the finish in Gothenburg, Brunel started a charge to the front, while Dong Feng slipped back through the pack. And after a high-speed blast across the North Sea, Becking's crew delivered another impressive leg win, their third of the race. The breeze started picking up by close to 40 knots, and I think, basically, I think the sail what we had was uh, probably uh, yeah, nearly brand new, and that's probably what the, what the difference was uh, probably in the boat speed, because we know New sails is normally pretty fast in one design, so in that sense, uh, thank you to the new J2. Matt Frey was second. It's just a little bit painful how we lost. Last night, these guys came a bit quicker than us, so we tried to hold them as much as possible, but they managed to pass, and, and then that was it. With Dong Fung languishing in fourth. Sell well, but not enough to win a leg, so maybe we don't take any, enough risk or so, I don't know. And but we need to take on the next one because I think on the next one we have no choice. We have to be ahead of the uh, two uh, boats. Cordrelier's team were expected to take the bonus point for the best elapsed time throughout the race. All three boats were now on even points going into the last 700-mile leg to The Hague. A nail-biting three-way shootout was in store for the closest final in the history of the race. Aarhus, Denmark. The clock is counting down to the Hempel Sailing World Championships in August. 1,000 boats, 1,500 sailors, 90 nations, 40 Olympic medalists and two weeks of racing. In the second of our two previews, we talked to some of the key double-handed teams during their preparation for the Worlds at Aarhus. Lisa and I are cousins, um, so we've known each other all our lives. We actually started sailing together in 2007. 
and we, our goal was to win the Youth Worlds, and it took us two goes at it, but we did it twice in Arcos and in Brazil, and we managed to win the gold together. And that's sort of, since then, we just teamed up and uh, been going since then and went to Rio, and now here we are trying to go for gold in Tokyo. Winning the silver medal in Rio was a fantastic experience for Jason and I. It was really hard because we were there for gold, so um, I don't think anyone can really appreciate that we were so disappointed winning an Olympic medal, but it makes you hungry. Like, we're, we're there to win gold and it just made us you know, really knuckle down now and make sure that we, we don't regret anything going to Tokyo. For some, the road to the Games will take them back to home waters. え、今年いっぱいまではあの、他の日本人選手と一緒に、え、合宿とか練習をしながら日本でのレベルを上げていって、え、来年から、え、少し海外の。え、2020年のオリンピックは、僕たちの、ま、日本で開催されるっていうこと